Hello and welcome to Intimacy Night at, of Happy Feet, Intimacy and Connection Night. Um, our guest speakers are tonight are Nicole Colossa, who is a survivorship nurse navigator at Allegheny Health Network Cancer Institute, and she has is also um, a facilitator for actually several of our groups here at the Cancer Caring Center. And she is just she's starting a new survivorship group, which is um, starting March 9th. Is that yes? Um, uh, so it's a fabulous group. If you're interested in joining that, I highly recommend it. Um, Nicole Riley Dosey is also with us. Is it Dosey? Is that, am I saying that right? Okay. And she, she was with us the first night, if you remember. So she is, um, uh, a large part of the phys on oncophysical therapy department. She's used the regional manager of patient services at Allegheny Health Network. And, um, it has a, you, you're, uh, been very involved in the onco therapy, correct? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. therapy. And um, <clears throat> they both have a wealth of knowledge of, of pelvic floor therapy and a lot of other um, uh, uh, modalities that will help. Um, but before, I did want to get into a little bit of housekeeping. I know it is uh, freezing rain out there and it's very difficult to get outside and exercise, but I'm to try to motivate you because I need the motivation myself um, just to try to keep that movement going try to find whatever you can I'll try to find some videos that I can post um, online just to try to <clears throat> keep us all moving because it's important as uh, both Nicole's will tell us as we move on into the meeting a couple things um, uh, this this week is uh, on Friday is National Caregivers Day we have two caregiver support groups I just wanted to share with you. One um, was tonight and it was our first young adult caregivers uh, support group, which is for people from 18 to 39. So that's a new group for us. And we've had an ongoing caregiver support group, which is tomorrow night, which is uh, once a month, uh, as well as the young adult and uh, the, care, the caregivers support as well. So if you, if you wouldn't mind you yourself, gone. Okay. Okay. I think I, I think I have everybody. And um, <clears throat> uh, the so we also have um, an onco dermatologist is coming on Wendy's uh, Zoom call at five o'clock this Wednesday, and this gentleman is uh, specializes in hair, skin, and nail issues that happen, uh, whether it's from radiation or from uh, a, a chemotherapy or some drug that you are continuing to take. And so I'm really looking forward to him. He's kind of pretty, it's a pretty um, uh, casual presentation. He doesn't have a lot of slides. He's very willing to answer any kind of questions. So um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, next Sunday for a Happy Feet program is we're going to be addressing spirituality, and we have a special speaker for that. And then Monday, uh, a week from today at five o'clock, Wendy's, <clears throat> uh, she invited Dr. Van London on to speak, who is from UPMC, she, her, that survivorship clinic, and she's talking about uh, cancer and the vaccine. And so she, she was only available Monday at five, so... <laughs> It always gets confusing. So she's going to do her, Wendy's um, group is going to move to next Monday next week instead of Wednesday. So and that's all of our housekeeping. Um, I will actually, um, well, we can pull, we can pull a winner for the gift card after we're done. But uh, uh, without further ado, I don't know, I, I, I already introduced both Nicole, so I'm not quite sure who, who will go first. You're muted. Sorry, I'm gonna go first. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm going to share my screen. Give me one. Oh wait, hold on. There we go. All right. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. 
Um, if there's a time where you can't, if I'm, because I'm using my computer audio and sometimes I'll move around. If you can't hear me, I'm moving my mic a little bit closer. Let me know. I've, I've um, been known to cut out sometimes. So please feel free to interrupt me and tell me if you can't hear me or have an issue. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jen, for inviting me in on your series. Um, this is a great series you guys are having. It's so important to take care of yourself, especially right now, you know, with everything going on. So I'm, you know, happy to be here um, to give you some tips on sexual intimacy and connection. Um, and then my colleague, Nicole, is going to join in and talk to you a little bit about pelvic floor rehab. Okay. So um, my um, background is I'm a survivorship nurse navigator for Allegheny Health Network. I have been with AHN for um, almost 12 years. I have some background in uh, chemotherapy, medical oncology. I spent time um, in radiation therapy as a nurse, and then I also worked in bone marrow transplant for a year. And now I'm happy to help um, kick off AHN survivorship program. We see patients at Allegheny General Hospital, Forbes, Wexford, and then we also do um, telehealth video visits. Um, so, you know, right now, you know, cancer diagnosis can affect many areas of a person's life, as you guys well know, and one of them being sexual dysfunction. So we bring the patients in um, after they're done with treatment to go over any side effects they might have and see what resources we can do for them. And then, um, Nicole, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, yeah, quick. I'll do that. <laughs> so I'm also Nicole. <laughs> and like Nicole said, I also work for the Allegheny Health Network. Um, my background is physical therapy. And um, one of my areas of concentration, I guess, would say is, so if I had to pick, even though I'm very involved on, in the oncology rehab team, um, my specialty within the oncology rehab team is pelvic floor therapy, um, which is either male pelvic health or female pelvic health. Pelvic health. Um, I also see patients that are going through some issues with uh, lymphedema. And, uh, and part of my other role is I do oversee therapy services at different offices within the South Hills region as well. Um, but like I said, tonight, my hat's going to be um, in the oncology pelvic floor world. So thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for having me. And I hope I want to keep mine pretty casual. So I'm going to, as I go through on mine and share some things, please feel free to jump in at any time and ask questions. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yes, you can ask questions, you know, through the chat if you prefer um, to remain anonymous or, you know, if you want to say something, you're, you're more than welcome to. We're here and having a good time tonight. Um, I do, I have like this up on this slide here about this odyssey that I had. So when I was in radiation oncology, I worked with my partner, uh, Jill McCullough Squire, who's also one of the um, uh, AHN nurse navigators. She's fabulous and she's my partner in crime here. Um, and then she also leads the Allegheny General Women's Health um, uh, support group with the Cancer Caring Center. And, you know, about three years ago, we started going into, you know, our sexual health patient education and fertility preservation because it's like one of those topics where, um, it's very important. It's a huge component of quality of life, but sometimes it's just not very, it's not addressed very well. So what we did was we worked with a project for the Cancer Institute on kind of researching, you know, evidence-based um, ways to treat sexual dysfunction to kind of help patients. And we revamped our uh, sexual health and fertility preservation um, patient education and staff education, because sometimes that's, it's really hard to break that barrier to talk to patients about these issues and start those conversations. So we're working um, really hard at making the uncomfortable more comfortable for our staff members. Um, I keep looking to the side. So if you see, because I see the box. So if you see me like looking, that's what I'm looking at. <laughs> um, okay, so I just have a couple um, disclaimers here. This presentation, um, in discussion is a compila compilation of evidence-based um, suggestions from literature review and information from professional journals and um, subject matter experts. I'm going to see if I can just lower it. There we go. There we go. 
Um, this information is not intended to take place of the advice of a uh, your doctor. This information is intended to lead guidance and personal conversations regarding these challenges, the nature of professional consultation to address these challenges and empowerment for self-advocacy for meeting these challenges. So what is sexuality? Uh, sex, sexuality, and intimacy are just as important for people with cancer as they are for people who don't have cancer. Sexuality encompasses much more than sex. It includes the physical psychological, emotional, and social aspects of sex. So in real world, this means how you see yourself, how your partner views you, how you date, and how you date after cancer. Um, you may have changes in your sex life before, during, and even after cancer treatment. Many cancer survivors say that they were not prepared for the changes in their sex lives. Sexual problems after cancer treatment are often caused by changes to your body from surgery, chemo, radiation, or other side effects from medications. And sometimes emotional issues can be the cause of sexual, sexual problems. So time to throw away assumptions. Often it's assumed that people um, who have sexual dysfunction that had cancer um, are just our, our gynae oncology patients, breast cancer patients from their hormonal therapy colorectal patients, you know, pelvic patients, um, and that they're the only ones that would be at risk for sexual dysfunction. But in reality, it's all people who have been treated for cancer have the potential for having sexual dysfunction related to their cancer and their treatment because it can affect your mind your, and your body. Um, and those are all important comp components in your sexuality. So I, I added this slide. This is um, different from, I did this presentation with the Cancer Caring Center with Jill um, a couple months ago. Um, and I added this slide because when we were revamping our patient education, I, a lot of it was geared toward if you had partner um, or partners or, you know, um, and it wasn't really addressing people that are single and dating. And so I just wanted to add these parts in here for those that are single or dating. Some tips to help um, is focus on activities that you have time to enjoy, such as a class or joining a club just to get to know people if you can. I mean, this it's a little hard right now with COVID-19. We have to kind of think outside the box there. But, you know, there's a lot of programs either virtually or, you know, um, online you can meet with people. You know, try not to let cancer be an excuse for not dating or trying to meet people. Wait until you feel a sense of trust and friendship before you tell a new date about your cancer and practice what you could practice what you'd say to them if you're worried about how you would handle it. And you think about how he or she may react and be ready for a response whenever you have those um, conversations. You know, think of dating as a learning process with the goal of having a social life you enjoy. Not every date has to be perfect. Um, for some people, you know, if they reject you, which can happen with or without having cancer, you know, just try to remember that you didn't fail and try to remember that not all dates worked out before you had cancer. So, you know, Take some pressure off yourself, get to know people, you know, once you feel comfortable to bring this up, then you can have those conversations. So, you know, even though your sex life may be different right now, depending on the changes that you've experienced in your journey to survivorship, you may find yourself on the path of needing to change the nature of your intimacy. So different can also be good, you know, keep an open mind and embrace that difference. Um, and then you can enjoy yourself a little bit more. A recent study found that 75% of doctors believe that they communicated satisfactorily, satisfactorily to their patients about their sexual health, but only 21% of the people that were treated by those doctors said that their talks went well. So now imagine how that would go with intimacy. Making the uncomfortable more comfortable. Um, when a patient talks to their pr provider, you know, I would say be honest and accurate. You can make notes about your issues. You can research potential solutions of the interests of what interests you and why and prepare to tell your provider by sending your questions and your research ahead of time. You can do that through your my chart if you feel more comfortable. So they're prepared to have that conversation with you if you're kind of nervous, just bringing it up. Like right now, we're trying to really assess patients more and kind of open that dialogue with the patients to see, you know, how how's how have you been doing? Are you having any side effects in these issues? Are you able to have sex? Is it satisfactory? Is there anything that we can do to help you through this? 
you know, go to your appointments with an open mind, be prepared to listen to recommendations, and then you can make an educated decision. You can also bring your partner or an advocate if you feel comfortable doing so to your appointment. Um, ask questions, you know, if, if you, if something doesn't seem right or doesn't feel right, you know, speak up. And then certainly if you are with your provider and they're not addressing your needs or you're not, um, you're not getting the feedback that you would like to hear, you know, you can certainly always change to another provider. You don't have to be stuck. I had a, a patient one time um, during one of these talks that had said, you know, I was having an issue and my provider said, well, that's just kind of what happens without even addressing any side, side effect management or different things that they can do. And that was, that was a shame for that patient because there are things that they can do and that provider should have been able to tell him that. So whenever you have issues with your partner, um, you know, communication is key. You know, you know, sometimes if you're having these difficult conversations, sitting face to face can sometimes be a little uncomfortable. So another way to make things less uncomfortable, you know, you can go for a short walk with your partner. So, you know, you may not be facing face to face, um, but be open and honest about, you know, what could be bothering you. Uh, prepare to jot down your thoughts. You can establish some internal ground rules or make them known. You know, you could stay eye level if possible or um, walk if that's easier for you. Avoid yelling or accusations or name calling. These are, this is between you and your partner. So avoid finger pointing and laying any blame if there's issues with your sex life. You know, and describing your concerns and things you'd like to happen differently, be as clear as possible and use specific examples. <clears throat> Make sure you understand what the other person has said before you respond. Listen, that's the best thing you can do when you have these conversations. If something's bothering you, you know, be, be um, open, honest, but then also listen to what they're saying to you and then you know how to communicate easier you know approach the conversation with openness and interest in problem solving rather than the need to be right you know keep the topic at hand and don't walk away or leave the conversation without the other person's agreement you know if you're having the conversation and it gets a little frustrating it's okay to have a you know a time out you know to kind of separate regroup your thoughts, not to get upset and then come back, you know, and have your discussion again. Take responsibility for the feelings the way that you do rather than blaming the other person and drop your assumptions. You're having the conversation to be able to be closer to someone. It doesn't make you more vulnerable, but you may, it may help you be more intimate. Remind each other in a respectful, more manner why you're here. So one of the things that you can do to help establish intimacy with your partner again is you have to resume the romantic relationship. You know, when when your partner um, is on treatment, that can be a very scary time for you and for your partner as well. And sometimes whenever you get into that mode of taking care of someone, you kind of lose that romantic connection. And sometimes you can almost develop this parent-child relationship that may have formed that they're, you know, moving you to pay, they're moving you to appointments, you're going to appointments together, you know, they're taking care of you. Did you eat this? Did you take your medicine? Did you do that? So whenever it comes time, you know, to be intimate, sometimes that can be difficult to get back into that um, relationship that you had. So it's important, you know, touch is very important. So when, instead of like, you know, your partner leading and guiding you, just hold hands, um, try to hug and kiss a little bit more to kind of make it a little bit more romantic. You know, you can reminisce about your history when you first met, when you started dating, you know, create a storyboard of pictures. You can go through important times that were in your relationship, you know, to kind of get that spark back. Uh, revisit places that you went for dates or movies, try to like reestablish um, what you lost um, by revisiting some memories that were special to you that can kind of trigger those feelings again. Return to the foundation. That's pretty much the big takeaway there. You know, hold hands instead of guiding or supporting, you know, engage and caress instead of supportive hugs, kiss on the lips rather than the cheek or the forehead. 
Resume t resuming touching can be gradual and uh, allows couples to once again establish that physical closeness they may not have with or without sex. You know, um, during treatment, touch is can be intrusive. You know, sometimes you can have this when you're going into these appointments, you know, you almost have like an out of mind, out of body experience about everything that's going on. Cause you know, you're being asked to take your clothes off, to be examined and, you know, just touch becomes a little bit more intrusive. So you kind of lose that sensuality that happens. So whenever you're trying to reestablish your intimacy again, and your sexuality, um, it's important to kind of reclaim those pleasurable sensations. You know, your partner may also experience a loss of sensitivity to pleasurable sensations because of anxiety, sadness, inadequate nutrition, sleep disturbances, and lack of exercise and fatigue. So, you know, it's important to take care of yourself and then if needed, go into counseling if um, it's emotional stress that's causing problems in your sex life. Other ways to help reintroduce pleasurable sensations, you know, you can do exercises as a couple that's called finger writing, where you, your partner will um, write a word on your hand or your arm, like softly, they try to like write the letters out. I mean, don't go really overboard with a huge sentence, but <laughs> like, if you write a word on, then the partner is supposed to be really, really focusing in on what you're writing to try to figure out what that word is. And when they're doing so, they're kind of training their mind to um, connect more to your touch and it has more feelings and meaning towards it. Um, you can decrease stress to increase response to desire, touch, and arousal. Deep breathing exercises and mindfulness are also helpful to help you get back into the mood. Reestablish body self-esteem and relaxation. That's really, really important when you're going back into your um, your intimacy. You know, during treatment, there can be a rejection or a disconnection to yourself and to your own body. So it's important when you're, you know, regaining those sexual feelings again that you know you are comfortable with your body and that you're enjoying yourself. Bathing is a good opportunity to do this. You know, you can use soaps and soft sponges um, to kind of, you know, feel around and just reintroduce yourself back, back to your body and, you know, claim your own sensuality again. Soothing, gentle notices and exploration of the body is, you know, really good to help establish that connection again. You can change your morning and bedtime routines. You know, you can practice affirmations to help, you know, feel better about yourself and have a more positive outlook. Um, get rid of old pajamas and socks or nightgowns, things that reminded you of hospitalizations or being at home not feeling well. Replace them with, you know, new um, pajamas or lingerie that might make you feel sexy or that feel good against your skin, make you feel good. Um, if you're feeling unattractive, consider what you can do better about your body and your appearance. You can find um, a lingerie if you have scars or if you have an if you have um, scars or ostomies from surgeries. You know, there's lingerie online that you can purchase to help, you know, cover those areas up so you feel better about yourself. You could try different lotions and um, perfumes, things that make you feel good. You know, when you feel good, you're, you just kind of have that spark, you little, you know, you feel better about yourself. So, you know, we talked about how to establish that romantic relationship, some tips there um, with your partner. And then we talked about how to kind of bring back that desire back into your life. And then we also talked about how to, you know, bring that sensuality and, and um, that need for an enjoyment from touch. And now, you know, reintroducing eroticism, you know, that can be slow and gradual. Masturbation is the, sometimes the best first step if you're comfortable doing so. Um, you can do, if you're with your partner, you can do body mapping with a light marker where if something is uncomfortable with you, you can circle an area to your partner and say, you know, I don't like it when you go there. Or if something is more appealing, you can kind of circle that area more and guide them to that area. That can be a fun activity for you guys. Uh, general massage also is an, a great way to reintroduce eroticism and then the use of a vibrator. Sensate focus is 
Um, you can, I'm not an expert in this area. However, if you look online, you can, it's taught by a um, professional, but sensate focus exercises are things that you can do with your partner to uh, allow touching again. So it's followed by certain guidelines, like in different stages of that exercise, there's only areas that you can touch. And then it kind of builds that, um, that desire um, for more. And um, there's different stages for that. Uh, that you can look up. Sorry, my screen froze there. So ultimately, you know, there is no ultimate goal. Pa pa partners should proceed at their own comfort level and go at your own pace. Finding solutions to sexual problems is not always a simple matter and you may need to seek help from a trained counselor or a medical professional. Other issues, you know, that can cause sexual dysfunction is problems with orgasm, which can be caused by nerve damage or could be caused from emotions. You know, um, everybody is different in this area, so don't worry about it. You know, with women, you know, tension and orgasm do not go together. So try to relax and don't get so worked up about it. Don't fake it to make it, ladies. You'll never get what you want. You know, be honest with your partner, know what you like um, and be vocal about it. You know, what, what, what is that you like, what you don't like? Um, honesty is the best policy and prevents barriers that are difficult to overcome. Some ways to help with your orgasm if you lost it is to use more of an intense form of stimulation, such as a vibrator, which can be purchased online or in an adult novelty store, or you can use any wand type massager that can be just found in a regular department store. One thing is wand massagers, you know, they, sometimes they can be too intense or they can be just right. What's nice about wand massagers though is that they're easy to travel with. So if you're getting your bags checked, you don't have to be embarrassed by anything. You know, just, you know, you have back issues. That's all they need to know. <laughs> so you can just use the wand massager. Um, if it's too intense, you can look for a small battery operated one. They produce less intense stimulation, but they can still do the trick. And um, you can also, leave your underwear on and then use the vibrator outside of the underwear to make the stimulation less intense. Um, if you feel okay with it, you can try it at first by yourself to take the pressure off yourself so you feel more comfortable, experiment with different speeds, what you like, see what you know can get you to where you need to go and then introduce it with your partner. And now Nicole's gonna talk about um, pelvic floor rehab in um, vaginal dilation. Nicole, just let me know whenever you just need me to hit next, okay? Okay, no problem. Okay. Wait, are you talking? I can't oh, hear there you. We go. I, there I we go. I put myself off mute, but didn't. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Um, just want to kind of st uh, start with just kind of correlating these two topics together. Um, I think it's, it's so important, you know, like I said, I do pelvic floor therapy for a living, both with um, male and female patients. And I can't um, reiterate enough that a lot of times what's going on from a physical standpoint um, could also be, I always feel like there's sometimes more than meets the eye to that is that, yes, there may be physical pain going along, but did that physical pain then cause some an emotional distress, you know what I mean? Related to the fact that things don't feel right and they're not functioning right, so that you're emotionally getting upset about it. Or because of maybe everything you've gone through, specifically when it comes to cancer, and this can happen to many different things in life, you know, people being in a car accident, having to uh, care for a family member can very much change the way you feel emotionally. And can that emotional stress also lead to, you know, the lack of desire then also to physical stress. So I tell people, did the chicken or the egg come first? That's really, really hard to tell. So I feel with a lot of cases when um, women or men are having physical pain in the pelvis, um, you know, specifically, you know, with intercourse or with intimacy is, it's also good to look at, is there some emotional components that go along with that? So everything that Nicole said, is so on the mark with, I, I tell a lot of my patients, if I feel like there's an emotional component going on with this, we wanna kind of attack this from both angles. So I very much encourage them to please feel comfortable, you know, talking to someone about that emotional aspect and, um, 
And I know that people hear this term and probably like, does that really exist? But yes, sex therapists really do exist. Um, there, you know, there's several that I have referred to in the past that do, uh, that are super helpful, but yeah, don't be afraid to ask those questions. So I always feel like this topic for me is always joke is everything you want to know, but you don't want to ask because it's <laughs> a little bit of a, uh, uncomfortable situation. So let me, there's something that popped up on the screen here. Let me, okay. Go ahead and get rid of that. So, you know, I want to preface this by saying, so the aspect of what I'm talking a lot is about those, you know, when you're going through a lot of this, this actual physical pain that you're having, maybe it's causing that lack of intimacy. It's causing that lack of desires because who wants to do something that should be pleasurable in life if you're in pain, right? So um, one of the areas that comes up very commonly um, for women that have gone through any type of gynecological cancer or even sometimes, um, and they've had to go through radiation, or they have had some type of um, breast cancer that their body's now deprived of estrogen, um, you know, there can definitely be changes to the, the vaginal integrity itself. And one of them is actually shortening of, you know, of the vagina itself because of some type of pelvic surgery. So if you had to have a hysterectomy or something like that and pelvic radiation. Um, this narrowing uh, literally is, is that in itself is the tissue starts to shrink um, and it becomes more, I like to use the word fibrotic, but like dry, which also leads to the other part of this is vaginal dryness um, because of that skin changes. So I always tell people the mucosa that we have in our mouth is the very same mucosa that you have in your vaginal cavity. So as that mucosa, if somebody's having chemo and that mucosa is starting to change in your mouth, the same thing can tend to happen also in the vaginal cavity as well. Um, the last thing that, uh, you know, I, I, that is very, very common, um, even more so probably I would say than the vaginal shortening and narrowing, but the two things I feel that go very much hand in hand are vaginal drown, dryness and tight pelvic floor muscles. So again, this is another one to the chicken or the egg come first is a lot of women develop these tight muscles because the estrogen helps supply blood, um, helps bring bread to the area. Muscles need blood to function. When muscles aren't getting the proper function, I used to, I like to use the term nutrition when it comes to estrogen, your, your nutrition for your pelvic floor, these muscles can become spastic or tight. So when they come spastic or tight, they're not very comfortable. And, and I'm using women in this example, but it, it goes very much the same for men, men that have had to go through prostate surgery or um, prostate rate, you know, radiation or something, the same thing happens is those muscles go into protection mode and they become very tight. Go ahead, Nicole, you can go to the next one, hon. Sorry about that. So um, on the female side, you know, obviously this is, we're talking about a vaginal cavity and we're talking about tissue and we're talking about, uh, you know, what, the, how the body naturally lubricates and stuff like that. So I tell everybody, just like as we get older, our skin gets dry, right? What do we do? We lotion up our body because it feels good and it feels moist and, you know, and you get that like suppleness back to your skin and it springs back and, and, and better. So that's no different. So um, I like to categorize, you know, some people will throw vaginal moisturizers and vaginal lubricants together. I kind of like to make them two separate categories. Um, so very commonly, uh, you know, a physician will prescribe estrogen for a woman and topical estrogen is estrogen that you apply to the vaginal area. But obviously with women that have had any type of cancer, um, a lot of oncologists want to stay away from that, you know, additional estrogen for a period of time. So one of the really good things on the market that uh, both of these products are great. Um, the one that seems to be a little bit more readily accessible or easily is called Replens. And basically what it is, is just like you moisturize your skin, it's a vaginal moisturizer. So you can put it in at night. I always tell people best time to use it at night because what goes up eventually goes down. Um, so uh, is it just applying it? It is non um, estrogen. Uh, and literally it's just a moisturizer. So one of the ones that's very easily to find in Walmart, Walgreens is called Replens. Um, this other one, yes, VM, uh, you can order it off of Amazon, but literally it's a moisturizer. And, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I'd also, if you'd want, you know, you could reach out to your physician and ask about consultation about that. But uh, there's, like I said, there's no estrogen component in it. So it's very much something you can just buy off your shelf. Um, go ahead, Nicole. 
So the other one is vaginal lubricant. So what do I categorize a lubricant different than a moisturizer? Moisturizer is just like I said, but it's like I moisturize my body in the morning. I'm also going to moisturize it, moisturize my, my vaginal area. Um, a lubricant is, is more something you'd like to use with sex. So lubricants can be a, ver a variety of different things. So these are purchase lubricants, but women can use a uh, vitamin E oil, uh, I've had women use olive oil. I've had women use coconut oil. So if they want to use something more natural based, you could do that. Um, lubricants come in water, water based, silicone based. There's also hybrid ones that are a little bit of a variety of, of water and silicone. Um, but I think the best one that a lot of my patients have given me feedback on is either something that's a silicone base or a hybrid brace because it just lasts longer. The water is going to absorb quicker where the silicone or, or the hybrid is going to last you a little bit longer. So the, obviously the point of a lubricant is to decrease the amount of friction. And I have some good um, examples here. This good, ke good clean love is one that people like, like a lot. It's pretty organic and pretty pure. Um, I, I have in here as a note is uh, most ones I tell people don't use petroleum or anything petroleum based because obviously petroleum can lead to a higher risk infection. Um, so again, these are another one of those things that don't be afraid. I, I have a lot of women, young women that, you know, are in their early, early, mid twenties, thirties that say, well, you know, I feel weird using a lubricant because I should be able to naturally produce this. And it's like, there's a lot of things that are going on and people at all ages and all. So I, I encourage people, don't be afraid to try a lubricant because you want things to feel comfortable or you're not going to have the desire to do it if things are uncomfortable. So, okay, go ahead, Nicole, you can go to the next one. Oh, I think we, wait. Oh, okay. So sorry. <laughs> Got confused here for a minute. So okay. how would I move things around a little bit to make it flow a little bit better? So one of the other things, um, so the lubricants and the moisturizers are going to help with the vaginal integrity. It's going to help with the tissue. It's going to help with the pliability and make it more moist. Um, another option is if you're having some vaginal shortening, where I tell people it doesn't necessarily even have to be the actual vaginal tissue. Sometimes you're, like we talked about, the pelvic floor muscles are very tight. So when those muscles are very tight, there's a couple of different options um, that you can try positionally. So we talk about here, try a different position. Sometimes, as we've all experienced this probably in our life, some positions better than others. And that doesn't change at any age or any time or at any um, sort of, you know, point in your killing process or disease process is, you know, changing positions can always be helpful. Um, the other thing that Nicole kind of touched upon, and this is so true in general, is we, we get into that. I, tell, I always say to people, like pretending like we're in the movies, right? The movies are, oh my God, it's that immediate attraction, rip off your clothes and everybody. Okay, we all know it's the real world, okay? That may happen in the movies, but there's nothing wrong with, and probably one of the best things that I, I ever heard a sex therapist say um, when I actually attended something that was oncology related was, it's okay to plan. So give yourself extra time. Give yourself time to think about it. Say, you know, put it on the calendar. Say Wednesday night is gonna be date night or intimacy night. And that's okay because it gives you time all day to think about like what makes you feel good. You might wear a special pair of underwear. He might wear a different cologne, like create that. So give yourself time to remember what it was like way back when, when you probably first met or depending on what age you were, the certain things you used to do to get you to that. point. So go ahead, Nicole, and go to the next one. Um, so again, we talked a little bit, you know, why, why does this occur? And, and radiation can definitely be an issue. Um, so one of the things that isn't, I tell people that you could separate, I wanna make this very clear. So Nicole talked about a little bit about what you could do to self-stimulate about using you know, a vaginal vibrator or sharing it with your partner or something like this. But then there's a medical aspect. And I like to tell people, I like to keep those distinctly different because I want them to be able, I have a lot of patients come in that will, you know, and I'll tell you a little bit about the dilator that will do vaginal dilation or also will have their significant help them a little bit, but I want them to understand that's the medical aspect of it. They're not doing the dilator for arousal. They're doing it to help um, relax the tissue, relax 
the muscles. Um, so I'm just gonna explain a little bit. I'll have you go to the next page there. You know, so again, what can you, what, you know, what can a woman do if she feels like the, the tissue doesn't want to kind of give, um, I, like I said, I always encourage a moisturizer and a lubricant. You definitely want to lube up the dilators and I can show you on the next page when the pole flips over. You know, the idea of this is, like I said, you're stretching that vaginal integrity. You're trying to get those muscles to relax. So a very good example I can give of this is if my hamstring is tight, I'm going to stretch it. So the, so you have muscles in your pelvic floor outside the tissue that the vaginal dilator is trying to kind of make a little room for, make that little relax. Those muscles also have to relax as well. Um, so uh, on the next page here, these are what vaginal dilators are. There's two sources I really like to use. Um, the first one's called Soul Source. Again, you can Google, there's you know the site right there. You can Google them. You can find them on Amazon. Um, the uh, Intimate Rose is another one. What I particularly like about these ones is they are very, they're silicone. So um, you can boil them so that, uh, you know what I mean? You're not getting, if you're worried about any type of infection, you can bo boil them to cleanse them. Um, they are rubberized. And I, so my joke always to people is this. It's so all kind of different dilators that they sell. Um, I particularly like these ones because unless, uh, remember the penis is not a bone. It is, you know, blood supply, it's tissue. So there is some pliability right to the penis when it's completely erectile. So, so the same thing with these type of dialers, there's some type of pliability. So what I have women do with these are, is, you know, the smaller, you can see they go from small to large, the smaller is when, you know, the tissue feels tighter or the muscles feel tighter. So you're just, you're starting with, I tell people like a static stretch, you know, I'm stretching my hamstring, I'm gonna put the dilator in and I'm just gonna leave it in and let the muscles and let the tissue relax. The goal is to build up, do you know what I mean? Your time and, and your size, but also the ability to be able to, you know, move it side to side, move it in and out. But this way, as a woman or even with your partner, you have control over, it's different than penetration. Do you know what I mean? Is you have control over how much, how this, and, it, and it, you're trying to do this from a medical perspective, not for arousal, just to get those, your, your body more relaxed and comfortable with the different, you know, when, when some women have this, they can only tolerate a smaller dilator and the goal is to kind of work yourself up. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, go ahead. Nicole, I did have, I did have, there were a couple of questions in the chat, which. Uh, oh, okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I can't, I don't know that I can't see anything. So that's weird. Well, yeah, no, they're just sending them to me. So. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead. And the, is the replenish, is that moisturizer better than a vitamin E suppository? I would say what, no. I think for everybody, it works a little bit differently. I have women that really, really like just using uh, a, you know, a vitamin E suppository. I have women that love the replens. I, I don't prefer one over the other. I think it's all what people individually like. And same thing with the lubricants. I think it's just individual preference. And like I said, I think the difference between the water base and the silicone or the hybrid is just, it lasts longer. So no, I don't have a preference on that. I just have one thing to add about the lubricants, though, that um, if you're using a latex condom, you have to, only, you can only use water-based. Correct. Thank you. Because <laughs> the silicone would break down the uh, latex and the condom. Right. And then whenever you're using certain, if you're using toys or anything like that, just, you know, see if, make sure that the lubricant is compatible with it. I mean, you because sometimes they're, they, I can't remember if it's, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden, if it breaks down silicone too, but I know the latex is a big one. Right. Jen, was there any other one? Um, I think the other one you're answering, but uh, we'll, if. Okay. So I always say this one, I call this one the for him and for her. So this is called the O-Nut. Um, it does look a little strange, I know, but it comes, you can see in stackable different sizes. So obviously if, so the idea of this is, is so this, um, can you see this one pointing to it? Is my pointer going, Nicole? No. no. Okay. The, the, I can kind of, I can move my. Plastic, if you go down to the bottom here, the thing that's supposed to be representing the penis, 
Um, obviously, you know, the rings, go, the idea of this is a lot of women have problems with penetration, right? With how deep the penetration is. The reason they're having problems with that is like you said, after some of these surgeries or after radiation or because the tissue, uh, lack of estrogen, because the tissue is, is, is not as, as pliable is they have an issue of how deep. Now, just to clarify this, everybody is for, you know, I've had this discussion with some of my um, urologists and, uh, you know, and from everything I've read is so most men need about three to four inches of penetration, you know, for arousal. Um, so the idea of these is to minimize, you know, from the, from, from the penis portion, how deep the penetration is going so that you're not hurting your significant other, but in the same sense, you're allowing yourself so much and you can kind of gauge these of less penetration to more penetration as you can tolerate it. So it's kind of that stop. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay. Go ahead, Nicole. And so I just like, re, like to reiterate, you know, everybody thinks, oh, pelvic floor therapy, if they've even heard of it, that's only for women. But no, it is for men. I know I did touch on a lot of things for women because obviously when it comes to um, pelvic pain, there's a lot of aspects that go into it with female pelvic pain. But I also want to reiterate, um, you know, pelvic floor therapy, there's a variety of different, you know, um, uh, diagnoses or things. Uh, elements that you could be having that would maybe necessitate or be a good idea for pelvic floor therapy. So we see everything from urinary incontinence um, to fecal incontinence to constipation, pain we specifically talked about today, erectile dysfunction. So again, I don't wanna leave our male, our male uh, viewers out here out is, is men do have uh, pelvic pain issues as well and sometimes do have erectile dysfunction issues. A lot of the pelvic pain issues do lead to some erectile dysfunction. But same thing, the, the pelvic floor for a man and woman is pretty much the same. It's just that obviously the male organs internally and the female organs internally. So there's, there's you know, aspects that we can do from an internal perspective and not to be graphic from the male perspective, um, you know, those muscles have to be addre addressed through, through the rectum um, to help release some of those muscles and stuff too. You can use just to let people know you can use um, these dilators also rectally for men that are having some of this pelvic floor pain issue that's coming from the, you know, is, is causing possible issues. Um, so just to kind of reiterate, there is, a, there is a large component that can be done from a male pelvic pain perspective, as well as a female. So it's not just for, not just for women anymore. <laughs> I think that's the, is that the last one, Nicole, or was there one other one? I don't think that was the last one. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then this one, and I'll let Nicole jump back in, but yeah, you know, regarding male intimacy and male pelvic floor, um, there's, you know, a lot of other aspects that goes, and I'm going to let her kind of pick up here as well too, unless somebody has any questions in particular that they want me to address now. I, I, I did get a question in the chat and it says, I, I, I'm wondering, is sex like an exercise for the vagina? That might sound silly, but it, if I don't remain sexually active, will I have more problems long term? I think. Go ahead, Nicole. Well, that, I was just going to add too with the, um, especially with pelvic. If you have pelvic radiation too, vaginal vaginal stenosis or vaginal vaginal narrowing can happen several years down the line from when treatment stopped. So, if you're sexually active, that is a good way to. Um, keep, you, you know, your um, vagina open, 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 comfortable. Um, but if you stop having sex, it's important that you use a vaginal dilator. Um, even if you're not having sex, it's really important though that your provider down the line can still do a good pelvic examination on you. And sometimes the narrowing can happen um, where it's even hard to get a speculum inside the vagina to have a thorough pelvic examination. So there's a real importance on vaginal dilation, either with the use of a dilator or with um, vaginal intercourse. Correct. So it is. I mean, so when somebody asks it, is it exercise? It, it is. It kind of, you know, <laughs> the, the old, you don't use it, you lose it, but it's in the sense of when we talk about, as especially for women, and so same thing for men is, um, you know, for women, it's like Nicole was saying, it's important because that tissue needs to continue to stay pliable. 
And as we get older, outside of any other medical condition, when we get older, we lack that estrogen. As we lack that estrogen, then as I said before, then that tissue isn't getting the proper, I'll say nutrition, like I said before. And therefore it does tend to want to be more rigid. So yes, you know, not, and that's why if you don't have sex for a while, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, Nicole, I just have a question. I'm the speaker. I don't have a question to the other. <laughs> You're like an expert. I just think about it. What do you have to talk about the um, Kegel balls at all in pelvic floor rehab? Like, do those help or those like the ones help? for strengthening? You mean? Yeah, like I'm I'm drawing a blank on what the name are. Ball ball. Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are those recommended also for? So I tell people this is so. I th so here's the thing is, I think I it depends on what's going on. I never like to recommend if I'm doing a talk with anybody and they're saying, you know, I think I'm having some weakness or I think I'm having some incontinence. Everybody thinks incontinence is related to weakness, but incontinence, you know, specifically more so in, well, it's, it's very, I should say more so in women. And, I'll, and I'm going to preface this by saying this is the reason incontinence um, could go for weakness or tightness in a female is with the male, their urethra is a lot longer, obviously because of the length of the penis. With a woman, your urethra is only about an inch long. So there's there's not a lot of, uh, you know, uh, there's not a lot of distance before you leave actually. So weakness can cause incontinence because you're not getting the good pelvic floor support. But tightness of the muscles, which doesn't mean they're weak or strong, just means I tell people, it's like me walking around all day like this. You know what I mean? So my muscles tend to be, can also cause incontinence because the muscles aren't functioning properly. So I always use the example of, I go to throw you a ball and you teach a kid what to catch a ball, put your arms out, right? And catch the ball and grab it. So your pelvic floor needs to be in that kind of arms out mode because when you time to sneeze or cough, you want to go like this and make sure the muscle's working. But if they tend to already be like this, if you're trying to do activity or if you cough or you sneeze, because there's no ability to, to re react or respond because the muscles are so tight, you could become inclined. So in saying all that background that I said to that is why I don't like to recommend um, kegels or strengthening is, especially when it comes to pelvic pain, it's usually a tightness issue. And if it comes to incontinence, it's hard to say, is it because they're weak or is it because they're too tight? So I try to stay away from that until I have a better idea of maybe what specifically is going on with a person. So it's funny, you know, I, I like to not talk about kegels as much because especially when we're talking about pain issues, um, that would be my last, that would strengthening would be my last thing. You know, uh, kegels would be my last go to all this other stuff would be kind of my forefront. And then if I find out later, Maybe there is some weakness on top of once we get these muscles to relax a little bit, maybe there is some underlying. So um, as far as ones that are like weighted, just to let you know, I'm not a big fan on the vaginal weight itself. I just think it's interesting. I think there's a lot of way to strengthen your pelvic floor without putting a weight inside and holding that weight in place because who needs that much weight inside their vagina? So I always find that kind of interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was just curious, like, yeah. you know, I was like, well, you're here. I, I have a question too. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. No, because a lot of people ask us that, you know, there's so many gadgets online uh, that, you know, supposedly help you with kegels or help you strengthen. And a lot of women always think it's my pelvic floor is weak, you know, especially if they've had some other type of surgeries, they think weakness, but really nine times out of 10, it, 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 it is tightness that, that's causing the problem, not weakness. That's okay. Thank you. Um, okay, um, so a few words on men's sexual health issues after cancer treatment. You know, there can have issues with erectile dysfunction, ejaculating urine rather than semen, dry orgasms, loss of sensation as well. They can have pain in the testicles or penis and body changes related to surgical cancer intervention. So guys, you're not alone. There are a host of interventions available for you as well. Um, pelvic floor rehab. Even though I'm going to update this and take Kegel exercises. <laughs> yes, yes, that's good. Yay. Because <laughs> I learned something from Nicole. <laughs> um, and then there's other treatments. There's vacuum devices, injections, plus CCs. Obviously, we know about medications out there on the market, um, relaxation techniques. 
um, therapy, cognitive behavioral health therapy, you know, uh, sex therapists, you know, medical interventions that are, are proven to show some promising results. So the takeaway from this is, you know, talk with your providers. And um, earlier I talked about a gentleman who um, was pretty much told like, oh, you know, well, sorry, it, this happened, but you know, it, it is what it is. You're getting older and it, and that's just not a good enough answer. There are, there is help out there. So um, if you go to a urologist, they can recommend different um, things for you. You know, overall well-being um, also, which, you know, this helps with women as well, but then also with males, you know, maintain a healthy blood pressure weight and reduce any risk of other comorbidities to help optimize healthy blood circulation um, to achieve erections. You know, avoid smoking to decrease the risk factors for erectile dysfunction. So that's another good reason if you were smoking to quit um, because it can cause ED. Um, and then it also can help, and it can also can uh, decrease your chances for arousal and orgasm. Just some safe sex notes here. Uh, use a condom to prevent exposure to your partner to anti-cancer anti therapy agents seven days after your last dose, regardless of the need for contraception that um, protects your partner from exposure to chemotherapy. For male and female pa patients, Follow your oncology provider's instructions with regard to contraception. If there's any possibility you or your partner may become pregnant, um, if you're sexually active, be sure to use a reliable form of birth control to prevent pregnancy while undergoing cancer treatment. For males, abnormalities have been noted in sperm for up to two years after the last dose of chemotherapy. So pre-treatment banked sperm can be used at any time. But talk with your doctor about when it's safe to conceive naturally um, once you're done with chemotherapy. In general, sexual activity is fine during treatment if interest, energy, and comfort levels allow. Sexual intercourse, whether oral, general um, intercourse, should be avoided if your blood counts are low to decrease the chance of infection or bleeding. When blood counts return to normal, sexual activity can resume. Avoid oral, vaginal, or anal sex if there's sores or ulcers are present in those areas. And if you had um, pelvic surgery, talk with your doctor prior to resuming any kind of sexual activity. Important reminders, tell your partner how you feel about your sex life and what you'd like to change. You might want to talk about your concerns, your beliefs about your sex life as um, and your, what your feelings are to help you feel better. Approaching it openly avoids blame, stays positive, and gives your partner a, a better sense of how you're feeling. Be proud of your body. It's been through a lot. Think of things that help you feel more attractive and confident and focus on the positive. Try to be aware of your thoughts since they can definitely affect your sex life. Talk to your clinical team about referrals to a social worker, a behavioral health therapist, or a sex therapist or you know, gynecologists, pelvic floor rehab, there's a lot of different people out there that can help support you with these. Any questions or comments? I have my email address up here as well if you needed to reach out to me after. Um, if you had any questions later, I'd be happy to answer any now. I'm going to stop sharing. And I can put mine in the chat as well. I'm sorry about that. I forgot to add mine. I didn't even think about it when I saw it. 